Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ivan. I'm a software engineer at Revolut. And at Revolut, I help merchants accept uh, in-person payments using Card Reader. So Revolut Card Reader one of, was one of the biggest projects in the acquiring department in terms of technical challenges, certifications, logistics. So I'm going to tell you things that we have learned that I wish I learned in the first place so the development would be much, much faster than it was. So I'm going to give you an overview of the project. We'll discuss lifecycle of the card reader. We'll discuss interesting bits of our architecture, challenges that we have faced, uh, discuss some development tools and how we do our integrations into Revolut apps. So let's start with the overview of the product. This is the Revolut reader. It allows Revolut merchants to accept card payments. It supports uh, contact, contactless payments, Apple Pay and Google Pay, and it supports online and offline pin verification. And we support online transactions only, so we need to be online to make the payments. Right now it works with uh, Revolut Retail, Business and POS apps. And it's been developed with a third party partner, uh, and industrial design has been done by Revolut. So all communication with the reader is done via Bluetooth Low Energy, and it works only with Revolut's backend. It doesn't work autonomously. And uh, it uh, supports following operations. You can scan and discover new readers, connect to a reader, update the reader, fetch and apply settings, and also perform a transaction. So let me give you a short demo of how it works. Um, so on the left, we have Revolut Business App, and on the right, we have uh, the Revolut Reader. Right now, I'm in the Merchant tab, and I'm going to make a new payment using Card Reader. And for that, I first need to scan for readers, discover, and uh, connect to a reader. So I've just discovered some readers, and I'm connecting to this one. There is standard iOS pairing, and after pairing with the reader is done, we can actually proceed to the payment and enter the amount. So we enter the amount and start our transaction. It's going to be displayed on the right, on the card reader. So I'm going to present my card that's saved in uh, Apple Pay. The transaction is going to go <coughs> through. So that's the basic flow from the very beginning to the end. And at the end of the payment, the reader still is connected. So the next time I'm, I'm doing my payment, I'm going to card reader. I will skip the scanning. I will skip the connection. I will go straight to the amount input screen and we'll start another transaction. So our goal is to make payments streamlined as possible so that merchants skip all these steps uh, necessary. So I'm doing another payments. I'm actually paying with my real card, so I spent a fortune debugging this in production, as you can see. <laughs> One penny, yeah. So now as a merchant, I'm going to display Bluetooth, because why not, right? And as you can see on the right, the reader has been disconnected. There is no longer this Bluetooth icon. Next time I'm making card reader payment, we're going to automatically reconnect to the last reader that's been used. And again, to the streamline the whole development. And we're ending up at the set amount screen and do the transaction. So everything else you have seen so far. Okay, let's go next. Uh, that's the timeline of the project. So we started in August 2020. And in December, the basic functionality has been ready. In May, we uh, passed the EMV L3 certification. EMV stands for European MasterCard and Visa, and basically a couple of hundred tests that uh, require you to process different types of cards by MasterCard and Visa, debit credit, you name it. And uh, yeah, passed the certification, went to public beta in June 2021, and did our public launch in the UK and Ireland almost a year later. We needed a lot of time to polish everything. Yeah, then we launched the reader for Revolut Pro users in retail app, and we launched in France, Spain, and Italy, and going to launch in more European countries later this year. That was overview of the product, so now let's talk about the card reader and how does it live. So um, when it comes to managing an external hardware device, we need to keep in mind that the iOS app lives its own life, so it can transition between background, foreground, Revol user, uh, Re Revolut user signs in and sign out, and card reader also lives its own life. It can turn off after 255 seconds of being idle. It can turn off basically whenever a user presses the power button, etc. And uh, we need, uh, we must identify all edge cases and uh, we need to avoid undefined behavior. So when we first approached this problem, it was quite tricky because edge cases were just popping up more and more. And we thought that we need to come with some kind of structure to basically name everything. So we decided to 
split this stuff into layers. So on the very bottom layer, uh, when we talk about communication between the app and the card reader, we need to handle situations when reader is being disconnected during any operation. Uh, so reader can disconnect because of increased distance from the iPhone, when user presses power button, when reader's battery depleted, when Bluetooth on iPhone uh, was disabled, as you just saw, and when reader is being idle. So for all these reasons, reader can disconnect, uh, but like completion handlers that we need to handle, those are in different places, so we needed to handle everything. Uh, we also need to handle timeout when customer's card is not presented, when uh, card spin is not entered, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, uh, on that level, we also need to make sure that battery level is sufficient for performing time-consuming operations. So those are edge cases defined on the up card reader level. Next, uh, if we talk about Revolut user, we need to be able to support multiple readers. So at every moment of time, only one reader can be used uh, in real time, but we can persist list of previously used readers and user can select from them later. We also need to be able to handle user logout because if your reader is still connected and user logs out, we need to remove list of previously used readers and disconnect from the reader if there is a present reader being connected. Uh, and yeah, we also need to handle feature flags in order to control availability of certain functionality based on the user. So those are edge cases on that uh, level. If we talk about Revolut app, other stuff pops up. We need to handle, obviously, app permissions. We're asking for Bluetooth permission and handle when it's not given. We need to be able to handle push notifications and deep links because in certain scenarios, we want to avoid navigating away from the card reader flows. For instance, from the update flow, we don't want to break it, uh, we're just ignoring push notifications deep links for this particular scenario. Uh, we also need to handle Revolut fast code view. It's a view that displayed on top of Revolut app when app is being idle, after, uh, after user is not touching anything, and we need to make sure that UI behi behind it is actually correctly updated. On iOS level, we need to support background mode, so we actually uh, support stuff when reader is getting updated when the app goes to background. Uh, we need to be able to handle resource loss, like internet connection, Bluetooth. We need to be able to handle phone call and video call. And on the last level, when it comes to Revolut ecosystem, we need to be able to prevent certain readers from being used. For example, when a reader has been stolen, we just want to make sure that it cannot be used anymore. And we want to force read update in case we are kicking up something new. And every network service that reader is using actually will reject your reader if it's not up to date. And we also want to force the app update in case there is a new version in App Store with some critical update that we want all of our merchants to start using. So as you can see, I just listed all these edge cases that pop up in, uh, in this structure. So once we had this structure, it was easier for us to identify new edge cases and handle them. And uh, I believe many of those edge cases that I just listed will be useful not only for card readers, but external hardware in general. So yeah, I think, I hope it was helpful. Oh, I forgot something. Yeah, uh, we need to force up update in order to continue using Reader. So, to, uh, as a conclusion, I would like to uh, show you this quote. So, programmers are not to be measured by their ingenuity and their logic by the completeness of their case analysis. So, that was, I guess, the first step that we did when uh, working on this project, identified all the edge cases. As for architecture, I'll be uh, showing you first the requirements. Uh, they're quite trivial, so we want our system to be testable. We want our core logic to be independent of the UI. We want to be independent of the card reader vendor to support more reader providers. And we want to enforce single operation at a time. So when the system is scanning, it cannot make transactions. When it's updating, it's, it cannot connect and stuff like that. And we want to support all this functionality that I just listed before, scanning, connecting, updating, applying settings, and performing a transaction. So uh, let me talk about the core logic first. Um, at the bottom of the slide, and I hope guys in the back can see it, we have the partner reader SDK that's been provided for us. Uh, it has this basic functionality for connecting to reader, so all Bluetooth communication has been done by third party partner. Making transaction and uh, stuff like that. But we're not calling it directly, we wrapped it in a reader service to make the systems above testable. So it's basically one-to-one -one mapping of methods that partner SDK has. And for every card reader operation, we have a dedicated interactor. Interactor is a Revolut term for controller, or whatever you call it. So we have a dedicated interactor for scanning, connection, updating, applying settings, and making a transaction. 
But the clients of the system, they're not using these interactors directly. Instead, they're using, uh, they're using the facade uh, read interactor that provides all the necessary functionality. And uh, from the bottom to the top, the whole system is testable because we make, uh, we have dependency injection in place and we can basically simulate whatever we want with mocks. So scanning interactor is obviously responsible for scanning for new readers. We also support infinite scanning. We want to loop the scanning operation. With connection, we can connect to a device that's been just discovered or we connect to a, a reader that's been persisted on the disk by its Bluetooth universal identifier. We can also reconnect, which is a fast operation when connection breaks in the middle of transaction. And we need to register our card reader with Revolut backend because Revolut backend tracks the state of all the reader. When it comes to card reader update, we can update uh, many components of the reader. We can update firmwares, configurations, security keys, and at the end of the update, we notify Revolut backend of applied updates. So again, they can track the state of the reader. Settings interactor is responsible for fetching device settings and applying device settings. Settings like Placale, uh, the device supports up to five languages, and uh, connection timeout uh, idle value. It's basically when reader disconnects if nothing happens. And obviously we have a transaction interactor that can perform and cancel a transaction. So yeah, and like I said, uh, the client actually uses reader interactor. And reader interactor itself is a finite state machine. So let's take a look at the states of our system. So the system starts in the disconnected state by default, then it can go to scanning. And once readers are discovered, we're going back to disconnected. Now from disconnected, we can go to connecting. And uh, if we're not successful, we're going back to disconnected. Also from connecting, we can go to connected idle. It's when, you, uh, it's when reader is connected, but nothing really happens. And uh, obviously reader can disconnect in that state. From connected idle, we can start updating our reader and finish our update by returning to back to idle. We can also uh, apply and fetch settings and then go back to idle. And obviously we can make a transaction and then go back connected idle. And from all of these states, reader can disconnect it for reasons that I mentioned before. So that's basically our automata and state machine. These are the states that we need to handle and process. And these are the transitions that are allowed. Now, yeah, uh, why we chose finite state machine? Basically, it enforces a single operation at a time, and adding a new state doesn't affect other states. So it's pretty isolated. And every state manages resources independently of other states and handles events independently of other states, which is good. And debugging a finite state machine comes down to debugging one of its states. Now, let's take a look at some code. Uh, so that's our generic class for finite state machine. It's very, very, very trivial, very simple. I know there are many finite state implementations uh, all over the GitHub. I really like Redux for JavaScript, uh, which has store events and actions. But this one is very, very simple. And it's focused on what we need. Basically, it's focused on whether we allow or not transitions from state A to state B. So we have this variable state, which is a generic one. We initialize our finite state machine with initial state. And uh, our state must conform to this protocol. Basically, uh, it must tell you if certain transition is permitted or not. So yeah, uh, finite state machine has this go to method. And uh, basically, when we want to go to the next state, we have two possible outcomes. We either go to next state or we don't. So uh, basically, it's up to the state to, to decide whether we can perform transition or not. If we can, we transition to new state and call the completion. So it's very, very trivial. Now, our read interactor inherits from this generic class and it defines its own read interactor state. So these are the states that we just saw on the previous slide uh, with all the possible variations. And the initial state is disconnected. So if uh, as a client of card read interactor, I would like to start scanning operation this is, uh, oh no, sorry about that, different one. So this is how we define if transition from state A to state B is possible. It's basically much longer and uh, states in our system are yenoms. And this is how you say that, for instance, you can go from disconnected to scanning, from disconnected to connecting, but not uh, vice versa. And what I really like about this stuff is if you add a new state, the compiler will always tell you, oh, something is missing. 
and you will be forced to think about what you're going to put there. So since it's finite and enums are finite. <laughs> um, yeah, so as a client of Read Interactive, you, if you want to start scanning, this is the API that you have. And uh, inside you have this, you're saying, I would like to go to the next state, which is scanning. If I can, I will, basically, and I'm going to success. So I'll, I'm going to actually call this system that's lying uh, below, do the scanning, and once I'm done, I'm going back to disconnected. And if I go, can't go to this state, I will just go to failure. So again, it's very, very simple, very trivial. And uh, the base class, finite state machine, doesn't actually store any data apart from the state itself. So all the interesting stuff happens in the closure of the on transition result. And I'm going to show you how this uh, works. So let me show you our debug screen. We'll talk about debug screen a bit later, but right now I'll, I will tell you that this is the screen that only developers have access to. It has buttons for all the functionality of the card reader, like scanning, pairing, uh, making one penny transaction, and it prints the log of all operations that happen inside the reader. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to press the scan button. It will initiate the scanning process. Then I will be pressing other buttons, and since scanning is still in progress, uh, I will be rejected because you cannot go from instance from scanning to pairing or from scanning to scanning. So let me press the button and show you. So, so the scanning started, and I'm pressing the scanning button again. And FSM says that this transition is not permitted. So it actually carries on previous scanning. So you can also cannot start transaction while you're scanning and stuff like that. So yeah, that's basically it. Scanning finished. Um, okay. Moving next. Now a few words about updating of reader because it was quite challenging, probably even more challenging than making a transaction. So. Card reader has several different components to update. So it has two firmwares. Card reader firmware where all the payment stuff and connections happens. Bluetooth chip, which is a separate chip firmware. And we have three configurations for contact and contactless transactions and for reader UI. So contact and contactless transactions, they define stuff like, uh, like upper limit for transaction where you don't need PIN and it's uh, different for each and every country. So we need to come up with uh, configurations on a country basis. Also we can update uh, the security keys for card data and for card PIN. And uh, the thing is that for this card reader order of updates matters and all updates are mandatory. And backend tracks the states of every reader. And if reader is not up to date, every card reader endpoint will return an error like please update a reader, you cannot make a transaction. Now, I would say that the key I would take from this is that you should let your backend drive the update process. And the more flexible you are, the better. Because uh, it's really nice when backend can actually define order of updates because things can change. And the app in the field that's not been updated should be able to adapt and actually be able to change the order of updates based on what backend tells you. Uh, yeah, and sometimes uh, bad stuff happens, like for instance, you need to update your reader from firmware 31 to 42 but somewhere in the middle there is a breaking uh, update, so you, you cannot basically update from 31 to 42. You need to update to some firmware in the middle. So it's good to have flexibility to support this kind of stuff. At, at least we have this situation once or twice. Backend needs to track compatibility of all updatable items because certain configurations are not compatible with certain firmwares, and etc. They need to be able to track uh, development and production versions of firmwares, etc. And also, they need to force update reader when region changed. We had this really interesting bug when uh, a reader has been used in the UK. Then something happened, it was returned to Warfire. And uh, then uh, it was sent to Ireland to a different merchant. And uh, they could not use it because the locale that was stored was for Great Britain, and they were trying to apply Irish locale. And from the backend perspective, it was like completely up-to-date reader, but for, for different region. So you also need to track this stuff and uh, Make sure that you update your reader when region has changed. And one more thing, make sure that user sees 1% and 100% update progress when update happens. Because due to rounding errors, sometimes the last thing that they see is 99%. And it's quite unsatisfied. So yeah, <laughs> just, just make sure that you send 1% at the end, just, just like the constant, and then, then 100. Yeah, uh, as for UI. so. At Revolut, we build UI as flows. So flow is basically an object that manages, manages 
a series of screens, and we have uh, an article on Medium that my colleague wrote about how flows work. And uh, for Reader, we have three flows, uh, flow for pairing, for payment, and for settings. So let me show you quickly another demo of Revolut Business on the left and two card readers on the right. And as you can see, one of those card readers is right now connected, the top one, it has the Bluetooth icon. So I'm going to settings, and I see that this reader is actually connected. We, we see it's uh, the green icon and the battery level. So I'm going to power it off manually. These are my hands. And uh, as you can see on the left, the app updates because it tracks the state of the reader. So now I'm going to scan for more readers and I'm going to connect to the reader below. As you can see in the office, we have many card readers, so I always need to be, need to be sure that I'm clicking the right one. So right now we have two readers, and this one is connected. And we have some context menu here, so for instance, we can forget reader, and it will be removed. And if you forget a reader that's connected right now, it will also disconnect. So the reader on the right, yeah, the Bluetooth icon just disappeared. So that was the um, settings flow. And the thing about our flow is that they're composable. So we're using pairing flow in conjunction with payment flow and with settings flow, as you just saw. So pairing flow is an entry point for other flows. It performs all the checks, like whether app update is required, if reader is already connected, if reader has been previously persisted, so we can skip connection and scanning. It performs scanning, it performs connection, and it performs update. It also checks for better level. Basically, it is safe to use the card reader after pairing flow completed with success. Now, a few words about app update is required. So sometimes we, we might need our merchants to update their app if we release something critical in the app store. And in that case, the dedicated screen will block merchant from using the reader. But uh, this check affects only card reader functionality. So if you're not using card reader, you will not be blocked. Only when you go to your payment, select card reader, the screen will be presented, and if you tap on update app, you'll be redirected to app store for, for your app to be updated. Uh, and battery level uh, is low uh, is also a very important check because if you power off a reader in the middle of firmware update, it can actually turn into a brick. We did it multiple times, and it was nice. Partners were, no, were not happy, to be honest. So after that, uh, we decided to add this check so we prevent firmware updates until either reader battery level is above a certain level or reader has been connected to a charger. But until we do this, you cannot proceed with updates and using the reader. Yeah, uh, so basically, uh, these were things that I wanted to talk with regards to what we need to handle. And uh, more challenges because uh, actually it was a very big project, like I said, and I will just, just name certain things that if you're working with external hardware, you might also have to deal with. So we did the card reader localization from the grown up with the partner because there were no means for that. So we can now define locale and get strings uh, back as expected. Uh, we worked on the declarative UI of the card reader. So the UI of the card reader itself is also configurable and uh, we worked on this. Very tricky part was cancellation of transaction because in the hardware it's possible only at certain stages and we needed to make sure that our cancel button is active or inactive based on the cancelability state of the transaction. Quite tricky. We needed to make some sanity checks for backend response because again, we don't want to turn reader into a brick when we're performing the firmware updates. Uh, we need to handle the ground mode. Uh, it was really a tricky one because we also need to support this scenario when you start updating uh, the reader from your phone, then you send up to background and the update should carry on. And uh, yeah, UI-wise, there might be scenarios when you start connecting to reader, it displays connecting screen, then you set up to the send up to the background, it, it, it connects, it starts update process, and we re return it to foreground, it will be a different UI, it will be like updated 35%. So it's one UI when you send up to background, and another one when you restore it to foreground. Quite tricky at a time. We also had to implement some tools for measuring reader performance for stuff like how much time it takes to connect to reader, to read the card, to read the pin, and stuff like that. So our partners could improve on, uh, on performance, and they actually did a great job. So reader is quite performant right now. Uh, we had to pass the European MasterCard Visa certification uh, by fine-tuning contact and contactless configurations. The, this job was mostly done by my backend colleague. So he did a great job there. 
emulating all the cards and seeing how they work. We implemented a tool for monitoring uh, readers remotely. So we were basically using, reusing our event system. We were batching events, masking sensitive data, and then send these events to our backend either every n seconds or when the batch size exceeds a certain threshold and in some other cases. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, writing unit tests for this thing was a bit tricky at first because we have Bluetooth and uh, as no simulator does not support Bluetooth and we had partners with SDK, but since we introduced this service wrapper layer, it was actually testable. And when you do this stuff, be sure that you wrap SDK calls 1-1 one, one. <laughs> because if you start doing something tricky in your wrappers, this is functionality that you cannot test and you don't want a untestable functionality in your code. Uh, yeah, we also did some integration tests like to be run with the physical devices. So uh, I wrote this test specifically that was running transaction after transaction and trying to cancel transaction at certain stages, like after event A, after event B, event C, and making sure that it actually works. And at the very early stages of development, we had some issues with memory leaks in the partner SDK. So I spent quite good time in memory graph seeing stuff like this or like this. So when you see this kind of stuff, you know that you're fighting memory leaks. And when you see stuff like this, you know that you're, fi <laughs> you know that you're fighting demons, right? <laughs> so yeah. Um, advice. If you find yourself in a situation like this, make sure that you take malloc stack logging and it actually gives you more information about who and when allocated the whole thing. So it saved my sanity, almost. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you don't think that managing state is tricky, consider the fact that 80% of all problems in all complex systems are fixed by rebooting. <laughs> so yeah, that was answer of our partners for memory leaks, like just, just reboot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, matter of fact, uh, there are some rovers ma somewhere on the Mars right now, and they actually reboot every two hours to make sure that there is no accumulated error. Like they're covered using four or five static code analyzers, but still they're rebooting every two hours to make sure that this expensive piece of hardware keeps sending us nice pictures. So, yeah, uh, and a few words about the development tools. Uh, actually, in developing environment, I was not using my card. I was using this beautiful card set, twenty something cards. Uh, they were simulating Mastercard, Visa, with offline online pin. And this is actually a very interesting business model because like usual cards, these cards have expiration date. And if you develop for more than two years, you can actually throw out your set and buy a new one uh, for a very competitive price of about 500 quid, because why not? <laughs> um, yeah, this is probably the nicest tool, the most expensive one, uh, so I never touched it. This is called Brand Test Tool BTT. So this thing can actually emulate any card. And my backend colleague engineer was playing with this stuff when passing the MV certification, so we can emulate any card, contact contactless, and it actually, on one side it can emulate card, on another card, uh, on another side it can detect what card reader writes on the card, because in some cases card reader writes stuff on the card, it's called issue script. For instance, if bank says that your card has been stolen, this information will be written on your card, the next time you try to insert it, they will say, oh no, 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 not good. <laughs> um, yeah. This uh, thing I actually used a lot. Uh, this is basically a smart card. We're very, very clever with names, right? This brand test tool, this is smart card tool. <laughs> so yeah, very smart. Um, this thing is used for flashing card reader completely. So you insert it like this, and then you run some scripts, and it flashes everything, all the firmwares. Um, yeah, use this thing a lot. And now for the debugging screen, let's go through some I hope interesting tools that we have. So on the right we have development version of the card reader uh, in black. And uh, this is the uh, development screen that you saw previously. So again, it has buttons that expose all the functionality that we have, scanning, pairing, etc. Here on the top we have this red thing which represents the state of the reader. Right now it's disconnected, it's red, so I carefully selected emoji for every state of the reader. We also print the version of the partner SDK in app version. And um, whatever we do with card reader, we have this rich logging information uh, being printed. And the reason for that is that when we started working on this project, it was beginning of the COVID. So we were expected to 
uh, work on this project with backend engineers in close contact, but we were actually isolated in our apartments, so I created this screen with a rich log, made a build for my colleague, and he was playing with the reader and um, reading all the logs. So again, I'm scanning for readers, this is what I have found. Then I'm going to pair with the reader. I hope, yeah. So we're connecting to development reader, getting some info from it, fetching uh, it, sending it to backend, registered backend, and yeah, we're ready to go. Uh, so yeah, this is the rich log that we have. We can also disconnect from the reader, and again, notice how this icon changes based on the state of the reader. It's top-notch technology, guys. We can fast reconnect to the rest, last uh, reader being used, and we can start a one penny transaction. So here I'm going to tap my development card, and actually transactions in development environment are quite slow because of our acquirer, so in development environment it takes some time to finish the transaction. It was approved, nice. Um, so yeah, and we have more tools in more. We can share this log that you just saw uh, with, with our friends and partners and whatnot. We use this feature quite a lot. Uh, also we can, uh, if we're brave enough, we can tap destruct if and we clear the screen or remove previously log files. Yeah. Next we have debug settings, so basically overwrite how card reader behaves. So for instance, we can say that backend asked us to update certain security keys, certain configurations, and this is always configurable just to test how the system works. I'm sure you have these similar screens in your apps, those standard. And we can also uh, fetch with the settings. So right now we will get battery state. And as you can see, black text here. Sorry guys, in the back. Uh, it is charging not, uh, false, sorry. <laughs> and the level of battery is about 60%. And also we can force update the reader. Like I said, we can update firmwares, configuration files, and etc. And here I'm going to update uh, configuration for you. But before I do that, let me just say a few words. So basically, when update happens, uh, we reach our backend saying, please give us latest update of, for instance, contact configuration files. We get this data in base64. And then we send this data via Bluetooth to the reader in uh, payloads. So basically, you can have updates in six payloads, 120, you name it. So contact update is quite fast. And I had to pause and explain everything before it happens. Oh yeah, we're always updating, guys. We're always updating, it happens. Um, yeah, it's that fast. I hope so. And uh, so right now, as you can see, this icon is green, which means that reader is connected. If we, if we leave the screen and we go to our normal payment flow, we will skip this connection uh, because we already paired. So it's basically, it's not important which UI you are using. Debug, production, it's still reader, still connected. We're carrying on with the transaction. And the good part is that we actually track the state of the reader even if the, in this production environment. So once the transaction is finished, I'm going to go back to my debug screen to discover that this transaction data has been recorded. Yeah, so transaction just finished and we put everything here into the log. So this purple stuff is actually quite different uh, card reader communicates with uh, acquirer using binary data. It's called EMV tags, EMV, Europe Mastercard Visa. Uh, it's, uh, the format is something like binary XML, TLV, type length value. And the thing is that when we get this response from the reader, we need to sometimes parse this data because this data is plain. It does not uh, have any sensitive information. So we need to be able to parse this data and then analyze what, uh, what reader returned us, how do we need to change our configs. So our backend engineer has been copying these values and trying to parse them a lot. Um, yeah, and lucky for us, uh, there are sites that actually allow you to decode this type of stuff online. So we basically copy this string from your log, put here, press submit, and then you get detailed information about what happened with your transaction. So it has the transaction type, date, cut holder verification method, etc. you name it. So my backend engineer did this stuff a lot, and he was like, can we speed up the process a little bit? And when I look at the URL here, I noticed that actually to open this parsed version of the TLV, 
We just pass hex data here. So that's the URL, and this is the stuff that comes uh, from the card reader. So let me show you something. Or maybe not. Because internet is far from ideal, unfortunately. Anyway, transaction just finished. We have saved this information of the EMB tags. We select EMB tags, select those tags that were written by Terminal. If we press Analyze, we're going to open Safari with the parsed values. So basically, we didn't try this tool ourselves. We just redirected it. We're taking prefix of the URL, and then we take this data, and my backend engineer is happy. So the sponsor of this technique is the following tweet. Yeah, that's a nice one. <laughs> These days probably you want to change it to ChatGPT or something, I don't know. Um, yeah. And a few words about integrations of the whole thing. First we implemented Card Reader for Revolut Business, and then we used it in Revolut Retail and Revolut Reader Public SDK. So we don't have any code duplication. And this is thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Andres, who I think last year gave a talk about how we utilize module system at Revolut. So be sure to check his uh, talk, it's a really good one. In a nutshell, uh, we have Business App, that integrates a bunch of modules. So we have card reader module with the core logic and everything. We have another module with the UI, and we have some module with customization exactly for business. We also have another client's retail app, and it reuses almost the same modules with some customization for the retail app. Also, we have card reader public SDK. It reuses only the logic, so it has different UI, so it, it depends only on one module and Revolut POS app uses this module. Revolut POS is a new app. Uh, POS stands for point of sale. It's basically like a digital shop where you can add items like coffees and croissants and then when customer comes, you can select those items and charge the customer. Let me give you, oh no, yeah, sorry. Well, we're using more modules. So everything at Revolut is modularized and for inputting amount and selecting products, we have another module that's being used in business app, retail, and in other Revolut products like, like uh, invoices, payment, and tap to pay Yeah, now for the demo of the POS app, real quick. So on the left, we have Revolut, Revolut POS app with goods that I sell, hot drinks, bourbon, and I think it's not even water, it's wafer. It's water with a, with a typo. Yeah, we sell this stuff these days. And basically, I add item, no, 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 I press the wrong button. I add items here, well, once I'm done, I press charge, and then I select card payment method. So I need to connect to the reader, I need to scan for them. As you can see, UI is slightly different, because different UI, yeah? And, uh, but core logic is the same. So we're trying to use as much as we can, and this is how it looks for the POS app. So yeah, same logic, different UI. Uh, and yeah, basically a few words about the development team. Uh, the card reader was launched thanks to many, many people, but for the very first year, it was just me and my colleagues, uh, Android engineer, backend engineer, and myself. So we carried it until the MB certification. Actually, this is an old photo. This is we in August 2020. When we launched card reader, we almost didn't change. <laughs> because like by far, it was one of the easiest projects I worked on. Like uh, ju just a breeze, right? So the key outcome of this talk, guys, is, is the following. The first step of any project is to grossly underestimate its complexity and difficulty. Please do this. That's it, folks. Thanks. Thank you, Ivan. Do we have questions? First one. Um, I've never been in that field before, so um, one, have two, you, um, how, how, does, how is the communication bec between the banking backend that is obviously there somehow, is that your part or is it part of some SDK you, 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 you bought? Yeah, right, um, basically this work is done by my backend colleagues, 
So okay. after we read the card reader data, there was like plain section, there was encrypted section that locally we simply cannot decode. We don't have means for that. Mm. We send this data to backend, and then they do their uh, their stuff. So w from from locally, we have no idea. It goes all over around the internet. It it goes to acquirer, it goes to bank that have issued the cards, like all over the instance. And go, then it goes back back to our backend, and then we forward this response to the card reader. Okay. For security, there must be some kind of uh, public-private key system involved, or how is it? How, yeah. how does the right. card reader authenticate itself? Uh, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, so security-wise, uh, there are measures on. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Security-wise, there are measures on uh, many, many levels. So, for instance, like I said, we can update card readers' uh, pin and data key. So those are actually. Uh, not the key that we use for every transaction. There is a new pair of key generated, so it's unique. And uh, this is how we encrypt the uh, data block and pin block. And then backend is able to decode it and forward it to to all the parties like mm. the acquirer and and bank issuer. Cool. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Uh, first of all, thanks for your talks. Was 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 very interesting. Um, I've been integrated uh, card readers also, and I love reading TLV structures. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, my question is uh, more how much of the transaction logic runs on the card reader and how much runs in the app or in the SDK? And second question, uh, some, some cards require pin entry. Is there a pin entry field on the card reader or is, is there an, ex uh, an extra Yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks thing. for the questions. The first one was about uh, how much for yeah, yeah, how, how much? Uh, yeah, yeah right. how much does the card reader, and uh, how much of the transaction does the SDK? Well, I have something hidden in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically uh, the transaction that card reader does. So the green stuff is where card reader is not involved, and pink stuff where it is involved. So we start with creating an order, which is a revolute term. And then we try to read the card. If we're successful, then we're trying to authorize payment. So authorize payment is the place where we actually call our backend, then they call acquirer, then they call bank issuer, and blah, blah. So once we get the response, we forward this response to the reader. And then card reader makes the final decision. Once we have this final decision, we can either capture funds or we can cancel authorization. So this is, uh, this is the reason when sometimes your transactions are in this pending state. It's because funds have been uh, authorized but not captured because sometimes it's a job on backend to capture all, all um, transactions in, in a row. So this is where Carvida is involved. I uh, hope it answers your first question. I think so, yeah. Yeah, uh, and as for the pin entry, I have another. Something in the bush. <laughs> Piano in the bush, we say. Um, let me skip to the interesting part. Yeah, so basically, let me show you and pause. So basically, this is a uh, UI for when you need to enter your PIN. And uh, my PIN is this one. <laughs> so yeah, please memorize. This is the UI. Green button, and then it goes through. So I hope it answers your second question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. You're welcome. So my question is Bluetooth Low Energy. Mm -hmm. You're probably using it. Yeah. Uh, I admire your bravery. I would never do this, I guess. I think there is too much, uh, there are too many unknown variables. Mm. So what is your story? How did you handle this? Did you run into any problems? Oh, a lot. Yes, of course. Uh, thanks for the question. So Bluetooth Low Energy was not my choice. It was the choice of the partner because this is the choice of uh, chip that our partners uh, selected to be part of the card reader. Now they made uh, communication, all, all of the communication on their side because there are certain set of requirements on how you communicate sensitive data over Bluetooth. And they did their own certification, like payment card industry, data storage certification or something. So they did the communication by Bluetooth. I was reading the data. However, uh, I mentioned briefly that in iOS, we have this issue with background mode. So if you need your app to do something in background, there's like a different solution for different problems. So it's one tick for using Bluetooth in background, another tick for playing sounds in background. And it was quite tricky because we got some undefined behavior, like 
in some scenarios when app goes to background during up the update process, it was sort of pausing sending the packets for no good reason. And uh, yeah, I think we resolved it by just removing something. I don't remember what, so that's science. Thank you so much for the detailed talk hey, filled with all the interesting parts. Yeah, I hope I didn't bore you. It the nitty great, gritty, yeah. really like it. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Oh, no, 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 we have some something else. Last one. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering, how did you split up the development between the firmware that was developed on device and your own app? Because that was a constant issue with our partners when we wanted to mm. connect to a, a Bluetooth device. Um, usually the, the, the hardware provider was uh, developing their own firmware and we always had to somehow align their development effort with ours. Yeah, it's a very good question. So let me go back in time. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, this one. So uh, this is the stuff that we can update on our card reader. So both firmwares come from our partner. So partner developed firmware. We don't. We, we didn't even see the code of it, right? As for configurations, they gave us the scheme, the format, and then we fine tune it for every every country. For instance. The contactless limit in the UK is 100 pound, so this is the value that we use there. As for speeding up the whole thing, basically we created a tool that measures performance for them. And then we said, please meet these uh, target uh, values that we would like to be. We basically took some of our re competitor readers, measured them, and we're saying like, we, we cannot be slower than them, okay? I think we should be faster, but we cannot be slower. So they, they did like some brilliant job there. Uh, I think they, Reduce time out here and there, but I didn't really dig into this. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, if that's it. I would like to thank you very much for listening to me. I would like to thank my fellow speakers for wonderful talks, and I would like to thank SwiftCon for having all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.